years before in my life, wondering how this would go today. But I'm thankful for his presence, thankful for his presence we felt in this service this morning. And I, I couldn't tell you how many times I've actually preached. You would imagine you can imagine I've been doing this for thirty three years, I think, this year, so probably a lot. But I'm just as nervous this morning as the first time. I want to be able to to present God's Word the way that He places it on my heart. And sometimes I, I feel like I don't deliver it the way that I felt it. And I want to make sure that's not the case this morning because I feel like we need to receive this Word because a lot of times, especially with familiar Bible stories, uh, we kind of get caught up in perspective of what, how we've heard it and how we've seen it and and uh, miss some things. But I just this story... This Bible story that we're going to share, too, that I'm going to share this morning, we've heard many times, just kind of want to look at it kind of from a different angle than what we've seen throughout the years. But turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 47, verse number 3. Brother Paul reminded me of this right after he got saved. This is the good news. Some people never heard the story at all, so this would be the first perspective they get of it if they've never heard these stories, but... Ezekiel chapter 47, we'll begin with verse number 3. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubics. And he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. The water, waters were to the knees. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through. The waters were to the loins. Afterwards, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen, waters to swim in a river that could not be passed over. Verse 6, And he said unto me, Son of man, Hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. He said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me. Remember, he's brought him through the waters. Now he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. As we study the Bible, we understand that Ezekiel is what is known as a major prophet. So he's not a novice. Matter of fact, Ezekiel, as you begin to study in Ezekiel and you begin to look to Ezekiel, many look to Ezekiel for end time prophecy. But he was a mighty man of God. But he was brought through the waters, going deeper and deeper, showing him that it could be done. But in verse 6, He was returned to the brink of the river, leaving him with a decision. And what was that decision? Quit or go deeper. Quit or go deeper. Can I tell you this morning, brother and sister, friend, there's plenty of places to quit along this journey. There's plenty of places, but we cannot afford to quit. That's what I want to preach to you this morning. There are plenty of places to quit. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. Thank you for your word. Thankful for your spirit. Thankful for your presence that we've already felt in this house this morning. And I deeply desire your anointing to deliver this word the way that you've placed it upon my heart for this service, God. And I ask you, Heavenly Father, for your anointing to flow in this place, speaking to our hearts, drawing us ever closer to you and your will and your way, your purpose and your plan. And we'll just thank you and praise you and glorify you for what's going to be accomplished through this word today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I wanted to borrow this story here in Ezekiel for a text. We're actually going to look in 2 Kings chapter 2 for, for the, the core, if you will, of our message. But Ezekiel here is taken on this journey. 
And I've always found this very interesting. We've, we've preached this every way imaginable. We've preached, why would you stay in the kiddie pool when you could be swimming? We've, you know, all the progressions of it. But here several years ago while studying this, I actually preached from these verses and also Romans 12, 1 and 2 back when Draven was younger and I used Draven to help me with that message. And most of the time in my preaching, I had Draven on my back because Draven was uh, depicting Ezekiel and this story and I was depicting the one, the, the servant, the one that was measuring out and I would measure a thousand and I'd pick him up and then I would go that few cubics and, you know, from each progression of that. But something that I never saw and something that I've never really uh, paid attention to or even know, know that I even heard it preached this way coming up was the fact that after going through all of those progressions, after carrying Ezekiel through all of those progressions and got him to waters to swim in, Ezekiel said it was waters that I could not pass over, waters to swim in. He does not say in that moment that he went into those waters, uh, but he says after that moment, though, that same one that brought him through the waters, uh, that showed him, that taught him, that invested, uh, and let him know that it could be done, brought him back to the brink of the river. Now, you could take this, these verses and you could teach a seminar on parenting. You could take these verses and you could do a seminar uh, on pastoral leadership uh, or on any kind of leadership uh, because there's this example that's showing and key. And it's uh, Ezekiel didn't have to do anything. Uh, it was a vision. He was brought through showing. See, it can be done. See, these are ankle-deep waters. There's nothing wrong with it. But, you know, I I can make a decision whether to to go deeper or not. So I have to measure. I have to count the cost. It says he measured a 1,000 cubics, uh, and he did that, and then he went deeper. Uh, And what did he do after that? He didn't say, come on, Ezekiel. No, he picked Ezekiel up, and he brought him through those. Uh, And then he says, uh, you know, it's to the the loins uh, and and deeper and deeper, and he he measures some more. uh, But each time, he does not say, come on out Ezekiel but no he brought him through uh, and he brought him through doing what Uh, setting an example scripture speaks a lot of this uh, that we that are older in the Lord need to be an example to the younger uh, that there's a path that we go down there's a path that we walk uh, they're thinking uh, it can't be done we're showing them uh, it can be done you can hold fast they hear hold fast to the profession of your faith without wavering uh, but they say you can't hold fast to the profession of your faith without wavering uh, so what is our responsibility uh, to show them yes you measure it you count the cost uh, and then you go through uh, and realize that there are deeper depths. Uh, there's a lot of places that we can stop, a lot of places uh, that we can quit along this journey. Uh, but it says that he brought him all the way through. But this was the interesting part to me. I'm not picking anybody up and toting them anymore. I'm too old for that. But he brought him back. And, I, and when I preached that morning, I brought Draven and I sat him or stood him right here on this platform, sat him down and walked away. And I asked him this question. Now, son, what are you going to do? We've been brought through. We've had the example set before us. I think of all of those that have blazed this trail before me. Uh, Brother Paul, I think of all of those. I was thinking about this as he was preaching uh, last Sunday night, all the times that I've depended on others to carry me through. Uh, when he was sharing that testimony of uh, of that pain that he was experiencing, uh, and th- this is by no means me uh, trying to think how great I am, because I told you this morning I felt like this is the first time I ever got up to go to a church to step in a pulpit. I know that I'm the least of all. Uh, As the Apostle Paul said, I I don't think more highly of myself than I ought to. uh, But from his testimony, when he was in such pain, uh, the Lord told him, go to your pastor's house. Uh, He showed up at my door that day. Uh, He came in there. I remember it vividly that day uh, that he walked in. uh, And we went into that front room. uh, And the power of God fell in that front room. uh, And if God ever healed anybody, he healed him uh, that day. Uh, But he also said later in the day, the pain came back. And I got to thinking about that. He's preaching last Sunday night, and I'm thinking. That's what preachers do. He was a preaching, and I was thinking about that, and I was looking on that. And I've often questioned since that time, Lord, why did the pain come back? Why, why did that happen? And I immediately went to Ezekiel where it said, He brought me through. 
He brought me through the waters. He brought, he took me to the brink uh, of miracles. He took me to the brink of waters to swim in. uh, And I saw that healing was possible. uh, And I saw and I knew that if I could get to my pastor's house, uh, but God said, what if you can't get to your pastor's house? Uh, What if you ring the doorbell uh, and he doesn't answer? Uh, What if you make that phone call in the middle of the night that you know uh, that he can get a prayer through? He can touch heaven. Uh, Oh no, all they've done is showed you uh, that God still uh, does super supernatural through men, women, boys and girls, uh, that God will still take uh, and use a man of God. Uh, But he is asking that question, uh, are you willing to go to those depths? You know what you need to do. And in that moment, he didn't imitate. He, I've said this about Brother Paul. He, he is, he's come up under my ministry, got saved uh, uh, under the ministry, and God's sanctified him, filled with him, the Holy Ghost, called him to preach. Uh, he, he has served under me as an intern. Uh, he's now my associate pastor. Uh, but you hear us both preach, and it's two different uh, methods. It's two different approaches. Uh, it's two different things. Uh, so he's not saying, well, if, I, if I'll fold my hands uh, like Brother Jamie did, or if I, uh, if I pray the way he prayed or say the things that he said. Uh, no, God told him, you know what you need to do. Uh, so the, the story tells us uh, that Ezekiel was brought back to the brink, uh, and he said, I showed you uh, that it could be done. Uh, now, we don't read anywhere that uh, that Ezekiel takes out a measuring rod uh, and begins to measure every time he takes the journey uh, and begins to count all the costs and do it. Uh, but we do know, because he is known as one of the greatest prophets of God, that he got into those waters to swim in. He was willing to go all the way. So I want us to keep that in mind as we go to our main story this morning, found in 2 Kings chapter 2. Let you turn there, 2 Kings chapter 2. This is another story that we've, we've heard preached so many ways. I've said this. I preached this actually in San Mateo, first time I ever preached it. And I was looking at my notes yesterday, and I was like, how did I preach what I preach from those notes? And so that made me real nervous of how the Lord wants us to go and what he wants to say to us today. Because How many know that when you pulled up, that sign doesn't say San Mateo out front? Might be the same message that I preached there, but this, this is for this morning. This is for this congregation. We can preach the same things in different places, but God may speak something totally different. That was in a revival. This is in a Sunday morning service. But this story we've seen preached over the years, at least I have, coming up. It's been preached at youth camps, youth services. It's been preached everywhere. And usually it's an older guy with a young guy following him all over the church, if they're going to use that example. But I want, I want to read it so you can get the context of it in verses 1 through 14, and then we want to come back and look at it. It came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went to Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. The sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? He said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. Elisha said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho, and the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yeah, I know it. Holds you your peace. Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither. So they two went over on dry ground, and it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elijah said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. 
And it came to pass as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them from asunder, both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took also up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and spoke the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elijah went over. Very familiar story to those that's been in church and around church. And like I said, it's been preached in so many different ways. And I want more and the double portion and some of the message titles that I have preached over the years coming back better than ever. I've preached that message title from this and, and willing to go all the way and, and so many different things. But as I read this story uh, here a few weeks ago, as I began to, to read through this story, I just began to look and begin to think. And then Brother Eddie, after I'd been uh, thinking on it, praying on it, he came in revival and he preached along these lines and he made some statements in that uh, that just confirmed what I was already thinking. And, and begin to just look at this story in a different way than I've ever looked at it before. And as I looked at this story before, I looked at it as going all the way. But this time, I looked at the story, Sister Gilda, and I said, man, there was plenty of places for them to quit. There was plenty of them place, plenty of places for them. We, sometimes we make this story all about Elisha. Because Elijah, we, we look at, some look at it and say, well, God was done with Elijah. He, he pretty much told Elijah, listen, son, you're finished. Uh, you're crying in a cave. Uh, just go and, and, and anoint somebody to take your place. Uh, but that was not the case. That was not it. Uh, see, we realize that Ezekiel uh, uh, was just like Elijah. And Elijah was just like Ezekiel in this aspect. Uh, they were not a novice. But we know uh, that though Elijah was not a novice, meaning uh, that he had a lot of experience, meaning uh, that God used him in mighty ways, uh, meaning that God began to transform lives through his ministry and and there's things of the prophecies of uh, Elijah that we hold to today uh, and, and there's a likening uh, in the New Testament of Elijah matter of fact the Mount of Transfiguration we know that Moses is there but, but who else is there Elijah so he is a mighty man of God but we know just a few moments before these verses he didn't look so mighty did he He's sitting in a cave, uh, and he's wishing to die, uh, and he is there in that cave, uh, and the Spirit of the Lord and the presence of the Lord says, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? Why are you in this place? What has brought you to this place? Uh, I have preached that in a domineering manner before, uh, like God saying, boy, what are you doing here? Uh, You're better than this. Uh, But I believe it was the compassion of God to say, uh, what has brought you to this low point in your life? Uh, Because God understands this and many times uh, from our human perspective we don't get this Uh, after our highest mountaintop there's going to be the lowest valley that was not familiar to Elijah but God knew that well See, I thought about this the other day that God's timing is not our timing and God's ways is not our ways he works on a different clock but God is very familiar of our clock How many times have you seen God come through right on time? I've seen him move and I've seen him come through uh, just in the right moment. Uh, Just as God knew what was going to happen, if Elijah would stay faithful uh, there after all the Bell's prophets did those things that they did, uh, and it was Elijah's turn to step up. Uh, God knew if Elijah was willing to step up uh, and to rebuild that altar and pray that evening sacrifice prayer, uh, God knew what he was going to do. He was going to answer with fire. uh, But it was up to Elijah to determine uh, if he was going to pray the prayer, uh, rebuild the altar, pray the prayer, uh, and do what he was supposed to do. Uh, and when Elijah did it, don't you know uh, that when fire fell that day and consumed the sacrifice, uh, and God moved so mightily, and all those prophets of Baal uh, were slain there that day, uh, don't you know that God knew uh, that that was going to happen? But God also knew that Jezebel was getting her pen ready to write a letter 
as she heard a report of her prophets. They were her prophets because she was a servant of Baal. She had heard the report of what happened. She's beginning to pen this letter. Take this to that quote-unquote man of God. He receives this letter after his greatest victory. And after this greatest victory, when he sees the power of God come, this letter from Jezebel gets to him and says, what you did to my prophets, uh, what you did to Baal's prophets, uh, by this time tomorrow, uh, the same is going to be you. Uh, so what does this do? This sends him running into this wilderness. Uh, this this is the man that we've just read about uh, that says, uh, I've got to go. Understand that he told Elijah, he didn't say, you have to go. Uh, he said, I have to go. Uh, this is something that I have to do. Uh, why is it? Uh, because he was in that lowest point of his life. Uh, and he, God looked at him in that cave, uh, this great man of God that had done great wonders uh, and seen the fire fall. Uh, and he said, son, uh, I didn't save you. I didn't call you. Uh, I didn't choose you uh, for you to go out like this. Maybe nobody here has ever suffered with depression. That's why that, that song that they sing, I Speak Jesus, that third verse, I felt like I told them they was probably getting sick of it. I kept throwing up three this morning because so many, so many are dealing with anxiety and depression. So many are dealing with that that game that the devil plays in our mind and he comes against us and he tries to bring us uh, to that lowest point in that lowest place. Uh, and, and, and I don't hold any consolation. Some say, well, uh, to be assured, uh, it's going to be all right because Elijah suffered from depression too. That does not give me much comfort. But this does give me comfort that God says, you're not going out like this. You're going out, but it's not going to be at the hand of Jezebel. Man, now understand, Jezebel's representing that evil spirit, uh, that spirit of the enemy. Uh, I can preach without them for a few minutes because I don't have to read anything. Uh, but that spirit uh, of Jezebel is that controlling spirit. Uh, and she put very clear in that letter uh, what she was going to do. Anybody had the devil tell you what he is going to do uh, and how you are finished and, and how you are done uh, and how you're never going to accomplish anything? Uh, you're never going to see anybody saved. Uh, you're never going to see a difference. Uh, your prayers are aren't getting anywhere uh, and nothing's going to happen. Matter of fact, I'm going to take you out. Uh, Matter of fact, you're done for. Uh, Matter of fact, you're finished. Uh, uh, She said, by this time tomorrow, the fate of you uh, is going to be the same uh, as those prophets. Uh, I find this very interesting uh, and I find this very exciting. Uh, Elijah never died. Uh, Not only did he never die at the hand of of Jezebel uh, or any of her servants, uh, he didn't die from a heart attack. Uh, He didn't die from cancer. Uh, He didn't die from any sickness. Uh, He didn't die at all. Uh, He was taken by a chariot. Uh, God said that he uh, is going to take him home. Uh, Oh, we'll just make sure uh, that Jezebel doesn't get any credit. uh, And the devil does not get any credit. Uh, Friend, can I remind you, uh, you might be at the lowest point in your life, uh, but you ain't going out like this. You ain't going out like this. You are a servant of the Most High God. You have not been called to sit on the sidelines to say, I guess I'm done. I said, you ain't done. It's it's very interesting to read here what the Lord speaks to Elijah. He tells him to go and anoint three people. We know one of those is Elisha. But the other that he was anointed was the king that would succeed Jezebel's husband. He said, you go ahead and anoint him because their days are numbered. Their days are numbered. He, she's, they're still in, in reigning. They're, she, he, he's still king. She's still queen. Uh, but he tells Elijah, you come out of this cave uh, and you go and you anoint uh, the next successor, the next king. Uh, and you go ahead and anoint the next prophet. Uh, see, that was important in that day, in that hour they were re- living in. Uh, that There had to be a king because they wanted one. God said, I'm going to give you a king, but you're always going to be, there's always going to be a prophet. 
Just think about that. I just thought of this as I was saying it. God gave them what they wanted. They said, give us a king. He said, all right, we're going to give you a king, and I'm going to give you a good man. I'm going to give. It says that Saul was a goodly man, but all of that power and all that kingship went to his head, and he was not so good after that. But he was given, he was given prophets that he didn't listen to. But then there's another king that comes up after Saul. Anybody who know who that second king was? It's a man after God's own heart. It's a man who committed adultery. It's a man who did who murdered someone. It's a man that as a man he did all of those things wrong. Oh, but thank God. God said, I'm going to give you a king. But something you have to understand about king, they're flesh and blood. They're common men. They're going to fall and they're going to falter and they're going to have their mess ups and they're going to walk on rooftops when they should be at war. They're going to do things that they're not supposed to do. Oh, they're thankful. I'm thanking God that he gave me a king. But can I tell you this morning, I'm thankful that God gave us a prophet. That God gave us a man of God. That God gave us someone that would look at the king and say, thou art the man. Nathan's just as important as David. I'm preaching something different than what my notes say. But Nathan, that prophet, Ezekiel, that prophet, Elijah, that prophet. And then God sees this kid out on this field with a yoke, yoked up to some ox and plowing. And we, don't, we don't know the whole story, the backstory to that. But God does not just go out in fields and pick up boys just because they're working real hard. We don't know the backstory, so God gives us some latitude here. God gives us, God has given us an imagination. I don't know about you, but sometimes my mind wanders. It tells us that David uh, began to play his harp on the backside of the wood while he was out there taking care of his father's sheep. Uh, I can't help but to think, Brother Jeremy, that Elisha's out there with those yoke of oxen, uh, and he's saying, there's got to be more than this. Have you ever worked a job? Brendan Rental Equipment's where I used to work. And I used to, rolling up welding lead, filthy from head to toe. It come back from those plants. I don't know if you've ever been in a pulp mill. But all that pulp and junk on those things, and we'd have to roll out those leads, and we'd have to tape them up, and we'd have to fix them, fold them up real good. I come in on Monday morning, there's a pile this high. Looks like a pile of black spaghetti. And I had to work my way through it. I come back after lunch. Said, I don't know why I came back, but I did. And then I find my way to the back of this warehouse, the old warehouse that they used to use. There was an old nasty bathroom back there. But that was my place to hide. I would go in that bathroom, and I would sit in there, and I'm like, what am I doing here? There's got to be more than this. See, my dad was my boss. He was a good boss. But my dad also started in the same place that I started. And I was telling him, I don't remember if it was during that time or in later years that I told my dad that story about that bathroom, and he laughed. He goes, that used to be my go-to place, too. And I would sit there and say, what am I doing here? So I can't help but to think that Elijah's thinking there's got to be more than life to this. And, and I don't know what it is. Uh, but, Lord, if you've got a plan for my life. Uh, see, God does not just take uh, uh, people that are uh, sinners and good-for-nothings and nobodies and anoint them to be prophets. So that tells me uh, that Elijah had to be at least a servant of God. Uh, he had to be uh, just at least desiring the things of God. Uh, there, there, you can't just uh, be from sin to prophet. You're not going to have no saved experience and say, I think I'm just going to start preaching because it's a lot better than ox, yoking up the oxen. Right? So that tells me that he had to have some relationship. But then Elijah comes by. Elijah thinks, I'm done. You've got you to remember this. Elijah thinks, I'm finished. I, I, everything that I do is useless. He, he don't even, this man who has impacted lives uh, separates himself from everybody and tries to hide out. Uh, he can't impact anybody. And basically what the Lord is saying to Elijah is you can't impact lives if you're in a cave by yourself. 
I've called you to impact life, son. And so we've got to get you uh, to a path of spiritual renewal because you're dying here. Uh, anybody ever feel that way that's been serving the Lord a long time? Uh, I need to be doing better than what I'm doing, but I'm dying here. Uh, I, matter of fact, I think I'd be better off dead is what Elijah's saying. Uh, I'd be, I'd probably be okay if uh, Jezebel would get a hold of me. Uh, or I better yet, Lord, don't let her get a hold. Just let me die in this cave. Uh, and the Lord said, no, that's never been my plan for you. Uh, see, we make a lot of plans for ourselves, but God says, no, that's never uh, been my plan for you. Uh, so some would say, well, uh, Elijah was watered down. Elijah was uh, weak and Elijah was worn. Elijah was this and Elijah was that. Elijah was a lot of things. But my God is still the same. That anointing that was upon his life on that mountain was the same anointing that was upon his life in that cave. It was the same anointing when he walks by this young boy, Elijah, and he just brushes his mantle up against him. That boy said, what in the world? What was that? He runs, burns the yoke, has a barbecue, kisses mom and daddy goodbye, and begins to follow Elijah. And this is usually where we pick up the story, uh, and this is usually at the point uh, where a preacher would get an older gentleman and a younger gentleman uh, and say, all right, you follow this one, uh, because we've made this about Elisha's journey. Uh, Elisha's journey to be uh, the prophet that gets a double portion, uh, and we make it clear because it's clear in Scripture uh, that his miracles, he asked for a double portion. And when you research it, he did double the miracles. So we, we focus a lot on that. But I think when we focus on that, we miss something. Uh, we miss something here. Uh, this is Elijah's, uh, Elisha's uh, spiritual growth journey. We know that. As he follows Elijah, he gets stronger and stronger and more confident in the faith. Did you notice uh, that he, he, Elijah, these are tough names. Not by themselves, but together, it's tough. And Elijah never looks back at Elijah and asks him what he wants and why are you following me until just before the end. Does that say that he hadn't seen enough in him yet? I don't know. But he's seen how far he would go. How far are you willing to go is what we see in the story. So we, we see that he had come through one of the lowest points of his life, and God places him. We said that this is a path of spiritual growth for Elijah, but what was it for Elijah? That's what we want to see here this morning. He placed him on a path of spiritual renewal. And what he did is he had him anoint his successor to follow him along that path. And that's what I want us to look at this morning, that path that they went down. I won't reread the verses, but I want us to look uh, at four stops that they made on that journey. Uh, four stops that I think that I have, at least I have preached, and at least the times that I've heard it preached, uh, was all about what Elisha got from this. Uh, but also we need to understand something from these four stops along this journey was this, uh, that Elijah, God was not done with Elijah yet, uh, and Elijah was not going down to this lowest point. Uh, God God called him and brought him to high places, uh, and he said, you're not going out like that. Uh, and so he called him out, and we see this journey is a path that Elijah has to take Elijah down for him to grow. Too many times we look at spiritual leaders and think that that's, that's all they are, is just spiritual leaders. But we're walking a path, too. We're walking a path too, and we're walking down this path, and there, and there's sometimes that we have to go places that we've been to before. As I begin to look at all of these places uh, and think of this season uh, in Elijah's life, I'm thinking for certain, uh, if, uh, even if he's never been to Gilgal, he's been to Bethel. At some point in his life, he had been to Bethel. At some point in his life, uh, he had been to Jericho. And possibly at some point in his life, uh, he had been to Jordan. Uh, I would think in our spiritual walk uh, that we as spiritual leaders, as pastors, uh, we've been to all these places. You have to understand what each one of these places uh, mean to understand that and to realize that. Uh, that we see that Elijah went to Elijah, and he says he goes to Gilgal. What does Gilgal mean? Separation. 
Elijah turns around and looks at Elijah and says, Terry, here I pray thee, get this, for the Lord hath sent me. The Lord hath sent me to Bethel. So he looks here at this place of separation, uh, and we begin to look uh, at this place of separation. uh, And we know that at Gilgal, uh, that Elisha had burned his yoke of oxen. He had kissed mom and dad goodbye. He had separated himself from that old life, and he said, I uh, am committing my ways to following this man of God, uh, and wherever he goes, uh, I have determined in my heart uh, that that's where I'm supposed to go. I'm supposed to fall under his leadership uh, and to learn how to serve God uh, and see where it takes me. Uh, And he said, Elisha, you've done that. You've separated yourself from the old life. Uh, Can I tell you, this is where a lot of people quit. This is where a lot of people quit. What do you mean quit? Uh, you go back on the Lord? No, no, no. I'm not talking. When I say the word quit, when, when I think of the word quit and you uh, think of the word quit, it may be two different things uh, because the context of we think of quit is I'm done. We walk out that door never to be seen again. Quit. I've quit a lot of jobs. And I don't report there every Monday morning because I quit. But that's not what I'm talking about. Probably a more adequate word that you would think to use here would be stay. That's a good place to stay. You ever looked at your kids and tell them, stay put. Sit right there. I got to go into the other room. You stay right there. Only to get to the other room to see that they're right there. It's just how it is. But he's looking at Elijah And he's saying, Elisha, understand something. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know why you're following me. And I really don't think he did at that moment. Uh, I know that he said, uh, you know, he's supposed to anoint him. uh, And he knows all of that. But he don't understand uh, because he knows. Because he says, the Lord has sent me. Uh, He he said, okay, God, uh, I brushed the mantle up against him. He's anointed. He's prepared. uh, And whatever needs to be done, let it be done. Uh, But he looks at him and he said, hey, you've separated yourself. Uh, Too many pastors, Sister Gilder, are standing in a pulpit uh, Sunday after Sunday telling people uh, you've come out from the world you've separated yourself uh, you've got a born again experience or you say that you're saved uh, and that's a good place to be uh, and too many pastors uh, are getting up and letting people know uh, that's a good place to settle down uh, that's a good place to stop uh, oh but there has to be somebody that says uh, but there has to be more uh, I want more uh, is this really uh, as far as I'm supposed to go uh, and and then this struck Elijah funny. I'm sure Elijah said, I got to go to Bethel. The Lord's calling you to Bethel? Then I'm going to Bethel. You're not staying here. Maybe Elisha looks back at Elijah and said, I don't think that you became the man of God that you are today by staying here. I don't read much or study much or research much uh, that you stayed in Gilgal very long. You passed through uh, Gilgal. Listen, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things passed away. All things become new. Uh, that's something to shout about. That's something to rejoice about. Uh, but that's not a place to quit. Uh, we've got to go further. Uh, because, listen, if we stay there, uh, we miss the next stop. He, he said, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. Uh, and you know what Bethel means? It's the house of bread in one place. Uh, but ultimately, what the name Bethel means is the presence of God. Elijah looks at Elijah and says, uh, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elijah said to him, as the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, I'm not, I will not leave thee. And it says, so they uh, went down uh, to Bethel. Uh, how many uh, seasoned Christians uh, says, I'm on a spiritual renewal journey. Uh, I've been there before. Uh, all the scripture tells us we need to do our first works over. Uh, and you know when will be a good time to do your first works over? Uh, is when you've been dwelling in a wilderness uh, and hanging out in a cave. When you've been at your lowest point, it'd be a good time to say, I think I need to go on a trip. I think I need to go on a journey. I think I need to do my first works over again. I think I need to learn what it is to hang out in Gilgal for a little while to experience separation, to come out from depression, to come out from anxiety, to come out from fear, to come out from that old way of thinking, that old way of doing things. I need to go on this journey again uh, and when you do that uh, and when you're willing to walk through separation instead of staying you enter into the presence of the Lord Elijah said you going where 
the presence of the Lord. Well, that's the reason I'm on this journey. I want to experience the presence of the Lord. Well, come on. Come on. So they both went down to Bethel. So they got to Bethel. All them church folks had been in there that stopped at Gilgal. I don't know if this is all the sons of the prophets moving from place to place or if it's just a group in each place. I tend to think it was just a group of them that stopped. That's as far as they went. The, all of these sons of the prophets looked at Elijah and said, you know he's going to be taken. We've never had a preacher stay. They don't stay very long. We've read the statistics. Don't get too close to a preacher because preachers move home. Man, God takes them out in whirlwinds. I, I, I remember this guy. He was just walking one day, and he got so close to God that he was no more. I mean, I don't, I don't know. See, it's, it's just something about those. They, 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 they're, they're too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. Don't you know the Lord's going to take him from you? He said, I know. Hold you a peace. What he is saying is, you stay here, and you decided this was your quitting place, uh, and you decided that you just wanted to have the label of being saved uh, and not go any deeper, uh, not me. Uh, He said, I know, just hold your peace. Uh, I know, just stay where you're at if you want to. Uh, Listen, you can't make anybody go any further than they want to go. Uh, Matter of fact, Elijah looked at Elijah and said, several had decided that this is a good place to live. Elijah said, not me. I don't want citizenship in Gilgal. Presence of the Lord is what I'm longing for. See, he wasn't looking beyond. See, too many times we're looking beyond the next leg of the journey, trying to see the big picture and trying to see, uh, listen, that's important. I get it. Uh, But all we're missing so much uh, when we don't enjoy the journey that we're on. And this journey uh, brought them to Bethel. When they got to Bethel, we not only had the sons of the prophet, Elijah said unto Elijah, Terry, here I pray thee. For the Lord has sent me to Jericho. Now, I think that this had to be a tough decision for Elijah myself. The presence of the Lord. In the presence of the Lord is where miracles take place. The house of bread. Sister Amy Kahn's got into cooking bread, and I haven't seen a loaf yet, but I'm just saying. Bread smells good. It's great for you in moderation, a lot of carbs, but bread. How many love to go into Subway when they're baking the bread? I just go in, smell the bread, and walk out because I can't afford to eat there. But the bread, fresh cooked bread, if it was just that, if it's just a house of bread. But no, it's the presence of God. Brother, Paul loves this. Can you hear that? Gets on my nerves. Brother, Paul loves it. Why? Because it's a reminder of one of his late night prayer meetings. When he asking the Lord, Lord, where are you? And he heard this thing squeak and he knew nobody was on the stage. And he felt, man, I'm in the presence. I'm in the presence of the Lord. So squeak on. It's a reminder of his presence. The scripture tells us about the presence of the Lord, uh, that the presence of the Lord, how it begins to move. The psalmist writes a lot about the presence of the Lord. Uh, listen, nobody had to write nothing. Uh, I don't have to hear a song or a sermon about the presence of the Lord uh, because I've been in the presence of the Lord. Uh, and what we know about the presence of the Lord and the presence of the Lord uh, is there's fullness of glory and, and joy and peace uh, and healings take place in his presence. Uh, matter of fact, that's what we come for uh, is to experience the presence of the Lord. Can I tell you, Elijah looked at Elijah and said, Terry here. Terry here. It's be a good place to quit. Matter of fact, son, if you quit here, I wouldn't think any less of you because who doesn't want to stay where the presence of the Lord is? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty freedom. 
No wonder the sons of the prophets stayed there and said, Elijah, don't you know uh, that Elijah is just one of those special breeds? Uh, he's going to follow this journey. God sent him on a journey, uh, and he may get some low points, uh, but when he knows that God's calling him to do something, uh, he's going to do it. There's no expectation uh, for you to do it. Uh, there, some people sit in the pew uh, and think, there's no expectation uh, for me to go on the spiritual journey uh, that God sends his prophets and his pastors uh, and his evangelists. Uh, some people got in their minds uh, that that's just what God expects preachers to do. Uh, that's just what God expects uh, uh, those that he's calling to higher ground. Uh, can I tell you uh, that God has called all of us uh, to go all the way with him? Uh, but some are saying, uh, I- I'm just going to stay here. I'm just going to stay right here. He said, Elijah, why don't you just stay right here for a little while? Maybe he said, you can catch up with me later. Elijah's thinking, not a bad idea, but before I do, where are you going? I told you the Lord's sending me to Jericho, and I need to go to Jericho. You know what Jericho means? Walking by faith. And Elijah's thinking to himself, I'm on this spiritual renewal journey, and I didn't do too good about walking by faith last time. Last time... I've been through it many times that I needed to walk by faith. But the last time, I ran deep in a wilderness. About starved myself to death when an angel had to feed me and tell me to take a nap because the journey was going to be too great for me. What journey was he talking about? He said, this journey you're going to go on is going to be too great for you because you left your faith back there on that mountain. You left that faith wherever you dropped that letter. You, you, you left uh, that walking by faith whenever the devil gave you a bad report. Uh, we come out of the presence of the Lord. Uh, and Elijah, I understand, son, that you want to stay here, but I can't stay here. Uh, because the presence of the Lord uh, leads me to understand that I've got to walk by faith. Uh, and he said, you know, uh, I've got to get it right this time. Uh, I've been getting it wrong too many times. Uh, how many will with me say, I've got it wrong too many times. Uh, so I'm on this spiritual renewal journey. Uh, I'm on this refresh journey uh, that I'm going to, I need to at least step out of the presence of the Lord. Oh, I love being in the presence of the Lord, uh, but I can't stay in a prayer closet. I I can't stay in camp meeting. I I can't stay in revival. I've got to walk in a place uh, where I don't see victory. Uh, I've got to walk in a place uh, where I'm getting letters from Jezebel, uh, when I'm getting uh, an enemy call uh, from every hand, uh, the enemy stretch from every hand, uh, and I've got to walk by faith, and I will learn that in Jericho. Elijah says, you're going to Jericho? I'm going to Jericho. I'm going to Jericho. Now, Terry here, son, you've done good. You've come a long ways. You need to just Terry here. No, sir. I want to learn to walk by faith. I want to learn to walk by faith. That's saying a lot. Walking by faith, not by sight, easy to say. Very difficult to do. Understand, Elijah, see all those guys over there? They quit right here. They've set up a pretty good ministry right here in Bethel, just always about the presence of the Lord. See, you've watched these guys. they got their own TV channels. They've got their own radio broadcasts. It's all, we're always in the presence of the Lord. They're in the presence of something. It's always all the, the gold and the glimmer and the shine and the good. and Like they've never gone through a battle. A preacher stands on this pulpit and tells you that he's never been through a battle. He's a liar. And liars don't go to heaven. Sister Amanda was sharing that this morning. I, I actually had somebody tell me one time, says, I have never seen my parents fight. I have never heard my parents argue. They, they must never fight. They never argue. Well, I hated to be the one as a teenage boy to break the news to them. Your parents fight. Your parents argue. Everybody has disagreements. And so it, some, I'm not saying you have knocked down drag outs and always get along in front of your kids. Either. They have to see that love overcomes everything. 
that I can disagree. See, something that has been lost in our society today is I can disagree with you but still love you. I can disagree with your lifestyle and still love you. For the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts that he commended his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so he, he is looking here at Elijah and he's saying, listen, they decided that they were going to stay here. Why don't you stay here? He says, the Lord liveth as thy soul liveth. I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And there's the sons of the prophets. I don't know if the same ones or not, like I said before, but maybe a different group said, don't you know the Lord's going to be taken? Take thy master from thy head today. He said, hold your peace. And Elijah, same thing at Jericho as he did at the stop of Gilgal and the stop of Bethel. Separation in the presence of the Lord. They're walk, he's learned to walk by faith. He said, man, I, I cannot express to you enough, Elijah, how proud I am of you to know that you've pressed in to learn to walk by faith. To not be affected by the things that you see. To not listen to those that tell you that this is, uh, this is God's not going to do anything more in you. You've overcome all of those obstacles to become. I think at this point in young Elijah's life, He's no longer a boy on the backside of the desert or wherever he was with his parents' oxen working. He's now a man of God. He's now exceeded the expectations of anyone, and he is following along. But remember, this journey is not just about Elisha. It's about Elijah as well. And he turns and he looks at him and he says, Terry, here, I pray you for the Lord hath sent me. To Jordan. I said, huh? No. I learned to walk by faith. I think that faith will carry me through Jordan. You know what Jordan represents? Death. And we're fixing to celebrate in a couple weeks. Resurrection. Death and resurrection. This will be the last stop of their of Elijah's spiritual renewal journey but this would be the last stop of elijah's first trip on this journey because how many knows that we got to go through all these places time and time again in our spiritual walk too many people think that it's just a a journey that you walk through that you pray through them things and then you get to a place and that's where you end up no you gotta walk it out time and time again Jordan, death and resurrection. What did he say about Jordan? Okay, let me understand something about Jordan. Spiritually. means that I'm not just separated, but I'm dying out completely to self. No thanks, I'm staying here with the sons of the prophets in Jericho. That's a good place to quit. I'm not Elisha. He said, I'm ready to die out because it's not just dying out because if you will die out to self, you'll be resurrected in newness of life. That's why we get baptized. That's the first thing we do when we get saved, but it's the last thing we do on our spiritual journey. It's the very, Some people never even reach this place. Uh, they, they die out to self, die out to their desires, die out to their wants, uh, die out to the flesh, uh, and become what God wants them to be. Uh, so death and resurrection, he says, The Lord liveth, the soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And the two went on. And there's those sons of the prophets to view. And then we get there where Elijah gets the mantle. Elijah's taken in the whirlwind, and Elijah gets the mantle. He has the mantle in his hand. And he's gone on this journey, and he's followed the man of God all the way. The man of God went on his spiritual renewal journey, and he is now renewed. God has taken him out in a blaze of glory, a chariot of fire. What a moment that was. But Elisha looks at that and says, he's gone, but I'm just getting started. He's gone. It's my time to do what God's called me to do. So he steps back to the brink of the Jordan, and he asks this question, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Because he knew Elijah had been taken. He smote those waters to find out Elijah was taken, but the Lord God of Elijah had not been taken. The anointing had not been taken because he had been taken on this spiritual growth journey, and now he was to come back 
just to see the power of God. What we see here is both of these men, both of these men had an opportunity to quit along that journey. He says, Terry, here, Elisha, the Lord had sent me. But he could have said, I'm staying here, Elijah. You can go on if you want to. I've already been there. I don't want to do that again. I don't want to put myself through that again. I don't want to face that again. You see what this story is doing? It's not leaving any of us out. Whether you're on a spiritual renewal journey or you're on a spiritual growth journey. I was in the shower this morning. I was thinking, at this point in the service, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to have some older Christians, some seasoned Christians, uh, to pick some younger Christians uh, to say, hey, I'm on my spiritual renewal journey, uh, and I want you to follow me uh, as you go on your spiritual growth journey. Uh, But I realize Elijah didn't pick Elisha. Elisha didn't pick Elijah, but God will place someone in your life to lead or someone in your life to follow the example of. Think about how important that is. We think it's all about me. No, somebody else is looking to see how far you're willing to go. How far you're willing to go. And Too many, too many says, I've already experienced that. I've already been there, done that. And I don't want to go through all that again. I don't want to go through all that again. Last time I did that, I got a letter from Jezebel. I got all the enemy's attention. I, I'm just not. No, Elijah went out in a blaze of glory. You, don't you see that when God sent a chariot to take him out, and all depression was gone, all anxiety was gone, all fear had gone. He had truly had a spiritual renewal experience. So why don't we decide, I'm not quitting here. I'm not quitting here. I'm not quitting here. And I'm not quitting here. And then those that have just been born again, just got saved, and feel the hand of God upon their life says, if they can go there, I can too. If they're willing to go deeper, I'll go deeper. If they're willing to show up every service, I'm willing to show up every service. If they're willing to go to revival, I'm willing to go to revival. If they're willing to have prayer time, I'm willing to have prayer time. If they're willing to step into the presence of the Lord, I'm going to step into the presence of the Lord. If they're going to walk by faith, I'm going to walk by faith. If they're going to trust God, I'm going to trust God. You see uh, what that builds up and that faith that comes. And so he says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? See, there's coming a day uh, that that man of God, that that prophet was gone, uh, but Elijah just said uh, there's work for me to do and he comes back uh, and it's noticeable the sons of the prophet says something different about Elisha he, he's not the same boy that we saw making all these stops He's not the same boy that we saw follow Elijah to the other side there the spirit the, the spirit that was on Elijah is now on Elisha. Do you want others to see? Uh, Have you ever looked at somebody's life uh, and said, I know that the Spirit of the Lord is upon them? uh, And the devil will tell you, you can never reach that place. Uh, Yes, you can. Uh, It's a place that those that hunger and thirst after righteousness uh, shall be filled. Uh, Those that say, I'm not quitting here, uh, and I'm not quitting here, uh, and I'm not quitting here, uh, and I'm not quitting here. uh, But there's some saying this morning, says, I wish you'd quit preaching because you preached a long time. I have, I know. I know, but it took a lot to get this out. Sometimes you can't say it all in 20 minutes. I never can because I take this seriously. I woke up this morning thinking, man, I I don't even deserve to stand in the pulpit. I I just had me one of those pity parties. I Lord, I don't even know why you called me. I don't even know what I'm doing here. Had me a cave experience. Just had a, I've had a rough week. I've called myself stupid more times this week than I have in a long time. It's just been a rough week. Not sinful things, just goofy things that weighs on you, that makes you feel like that, that makes you feel insignificant. So when the Lord laid this upon my heart and said, who am I to preach this? You know, Elijah was probably thinking the same thing. Who am I to brush my mantle up against him? You know where I've been for the last several days? You had to send an angel to feed me and tell me to take a nap. And you're 
want me to anoint people? Yeah, because you need to see and experience the excitement of new growth spiritually for you. But you know what's more important to real men of God? It's not about my spiritual renewal journey because my spiritual renewal journey don't do me a whole lot of good if I'm not watching somebody falling along getting a spiritual growth journey. Man, it excites me to see people grow in the Lord. It excites me. Do you think uh, that Elijah looks down from heaven saying, that ain't fair. He did just did twice as many miracles as me. When I was there, he was known, and after I died or t- was taken, all he was known was the one that washed my hands. No. Scripture tells us a great cloud of witness, and can I tell you with every miracle, there's up there in that great cloud of witness, Elijah saying, come on, son. Come on, son. You asked for a double portion, uh, and you're getting it. Uh, You're wanting it, uh, and you got it. And one day, you're going to be here. Uh, I don't know how God's going to get you here, uh, but one day, you're going to get here. Uh, One day, uh, you're going to press here. Uh, But you see the importance of understanding, one day, I'm going to be there. uh, But I'm not there yet. There's miracles uh, for God to work. There's souls to be reached, uh, lives to be touched, uh, and to know, and to know why we're on this journey. I'm closing. Of grace, if you'll come and help me. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Stand with me this morning. I want you to understand this. There are plenty of places to quit. There's plenty of opportunities to quit, to stay satisfied, that is. And too many are taking that opportunity. Too many are setting up camp, building their lives around. Not bad places to be, any of those stops. Separation, it's a great place to be. Presence of the Lord, wonderful place to be. Walking by faith, can't beat that. But you're not going to get to death and resurrection until you pass through those other three places. Nobody reaches. See, there's just certain places. A man comes up to a man and says, how can I get there? You can't get there from here. You can't get there from here. I, I don't know the geographic locations of how you do it, but I would imagine that they would say you can't get to Jordan without going through Bethel and Bethel going through Jericho. See, you can't get to Jacksonville without going through Middleburg if you go up Blanding. You still have to go through Middleburg and then Baldwin, whatever. See, there's just certain places that you have to go through. If we can begin to understand that, that will help us in our spiritual growth as well. Along this path of spiritual growth, spiritual renewal, whichever one it is for you, whether it's your Elijah journey or your Elijah journey, none of those places will leave you satisfied spiritually. You might convince yourself that I'm satisfied spiritually, but if you're being really honest, I know I I need more. I want more. There's got to be more. And so if you're willing to go all the way, can I tell you, you can't stop now. If you're willing to go all the way, quitting, walking away is definitely not an option. But staying put is definitely not an option. You're separated from the world. That's great. I'm glad to see that you've come out from among the world and you've made a commitment. But you know what your commitment was? To follow Christ. And he gave us a great commission. Anybody know what the great commission does not say? It does not say, stay ye. It says, go ye. How many is willing to go all the way? How many is willing to say, the Lord had sent me. Elijah said, how many of you seasoned Christians been doing this for a while? Said, the Lord has told me I need to go Back to Bethel. The Lord has told me I need to make another stop at Jericho. The Lord has told me I need to stop at Jordan again. Maybe maybe he's calling you all the way back to where you started at Gilgal. 
saying, you need to take a visit there. If that's you, you're a seasoned Christian. I want you to come. Come in this altar and say, Lord, this is a path of spiritual renewal that I need to go down. I've been serving you a long time, and I've experienced what it is to go all the way. But I feel like I need to go, feel like you're calling me on this journey again. And maybe there's some, some new Christians, you haven't been serving the Lord very long, said, I've, I've never been in the presence of the Lord like that. I've never learned what it is to walk by faith. As these come, why don't you just follow them? Why don't you just step in and begin to follow the lead and know that there is greater depths, waters to swim in, life and life more abundantly. Heavenly Father, I've delivered my heart, and I pray that it's found a good place today in Jesus' name.